Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the Power Women in Insurance podcast. And I have a new friend of mine who has really captured my soul, has captured such a beautiful journey in the insurance space, filled with such joy, advocacy, and really standing up for women across the world, across the United States, across the industry. And I am super excited to be able to bring her on the podcast today so you can get to know her and love her as much as I do. So Kalia, welcome to the podcast. It's so good to be here, and I'm pumped that I actually got to meet you in real life before I got to be on here. So that well, was I was that excited because I reached out like right before the conference. We went to Insurance Soup Live, and you were speaking, and I was so excited to see you. But then it was like you were just surrounded by people because you're so dynamic and so beautiful on stage. And it was so funny. I was like, "Hey, I don't mean to bother you, but hi, we're supposed to talk at some point." It was so funny, and I was like, and we were like, "Ah," oh, and then things settled down, so we got to connect a little bit more. So, but you did such a great job on stage at Soup Live and it was such a great event. So thank you for sharing your heart up there. I mean, I know that took a lot of um a lot of courage and guts because speaking on the stage is scary, period. But you were just yeah. super real and honest and you really brought your heart and your soul to it. So thank you so much for what you give. Yeah. And it was so funny because everybody had asked my husband, he was there. They were like, she must have rehearsed for days and weeks and months. And, you know, I found out uh, about eight months before the the actual event that I was going to be speaking. And I started, I'm a procrastinator girl that, you know, <laughs> which is part of it. And I started practicing like that week and, you know, I made my slideshow or whatever, started practicing and everybody was like, she must have just worked so hard. And he said, girl, everything she said on stage wasn't a thing that came out of her mouth when she was practicing. <laughs> so it, you know it was a, it was a god thing to me it was like yeah. the things that needed to be said were said so it worked out it worked out well I agree I agree I think sometimes we need to do that we need to kind of go with the flow we need to go with what's needed in the moment and what we're called to be able to do because I know mm -hmm. actually I was on the stage at one point in San Diego back a couple of years back and I made some comment I don't it was some joke or whatever it's totally off the fly nothing I've ever said to anyone else in my entire life I don't even remember saying it and I think I said something like we need to make sure we compliment our clients and we tell them we appreciate them. Right. And, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think what I said was, you know, because if you tell me you love my shirt, I'm going to be wearing this shirt every darn day. So therefore, you know, you want to make sure that you tell people that they look, you know, they look great. I really like your shirt. I try to give at least five compliments per day to random strangers, just a gra attitude of gratitude. Right. So then I'm walking around the conference and like random people walked up to me like, I really like your shirt. I was like, thanks. Oh my gosh, this shirt is awesome. But I had no idea that I had actually said it because I was so in the moment. You are, yeah. And I it was so funny because I mentioned later, I was like, man, this shirt is getting a lot of compliments. And they're like, you know, that's from your talk, right? I go, what do you mean? And they're like, because you said... That, you know, if you give your team, if you give your team member or a client a compliment, they're going to remember mm -hmm. it because if you tell oh, me yeah. you like my shirt, I'm going to wear this shirt every darn day. And I just went, I did say that, didn't I? It was You're so funny that it took me like four hours to figure out why in the world everybody liked my shirt. Yeah. And you were just walking around like, this was last minute pick. I was feeling myself that day. Exactly. <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. Exactly. But you did such a great job. And, and you are um, from Coleman, Alabama. So yes. I love that. And I love, I know that uh, you live right down the street from Big Shout Out, my, my good friend Bree, who works, works with the, us over at the Sterling Insurance Group. She's also out there in Alabama. So I, I am her. super excited. I know that she just looks up to you. And I know what you have helped her mentally and emotionally feel so comfortable with just with the concept of the daily lifestyle that like we all live as women and so forth. So um, I want to make sure that the, everybody else gets to know you too. So I'm really excited. Okay. So let's start off. Tell me about how you got in the insurance industry a little bit and a little bit about your journey to get here. Okay. So I'll start with the insurance and then I'll kind of give you a, a life backstory. Um, so I was in college to be a teacher, um, home ec teacher. Is that not the most Southern thing ever? Because of course <laughs> I love to garden and I love to cook and I love to do all those things, but you know, and, and I hate to say this, my husband gets on to me all the time. He's like, you can't say that to people. I don't like kids. Like, <laughs> you know, I like my kids and I like my friend's kids and, but you know, I just don't want to be around kids all day. And I was in college and I, I, I was at work working at a cell phone company and I was doing sales and I loved it. Um, and I was, and I noticed that I was really good at it and not for other, like not for technology reasons, not because I was savvy with stuff like that. I just love to talk to people. Like, you know, I love, like you and I were talking about, um, before, like, I love to hear people's stories and you know, mm -hmm. all that. And that really, you know, I think bled through what I was doing in sales. So I had met, um, a lady who worked for state 
Farm and she came in and she recruited me to work for State Farm and I put in my notice. And the same week I had a friend of mine that I know forever who was opening an also agency and he was like, listen, I want you to come work for me. So, you know, don't go work for the State Farm lady. Come work for me. And, you know, this was uh, 12, 13 years ago. Yeah, almost 13 years ago. And um, when he and I were talking about everything, he was like, you know, at that time, Allstate was super lucrative. And he was like, we've got all this stuff, honoring and all this, like, I want you to be a part of this. So I just went in head first and I started as um, an LSP. Um, I know you've got Allstate background, so you, you're aware of that. So I was an LSP and um, we were one of the only Allstate agencies in Alabama that was trained through Conexus um, to do, uh, Conexus is so much fun, um, <laughs> to, to do commercial. So um, that's kind of what I did. I ended up being an associate agent for him, worked for him for six years, love him still to this day. He's one of my clients. Um, you know, we're friends. And I was just like, you know, I want to, I want to be, I want to do something more like, what else do I want to do? And the thing that hurt me the most with Allstate is when I would lose a customer. And, you know, when you, you're in a captive setting and, you know, that works out great for some people. I'm in this business for relationships. And I still, to this day, you know, some of my greatest friends that I have are people that, who, you know, gave me a chance on a renter's insurance policy when I was 21 years old. And then it, you know, formed, I've watched it turn into, you know, auto insurance and then into then buying a house and then buying rental properties. So that's kind of how I got in the, in, in the industry. And then I, um, in 2021, I decided, you know what, I want to, I want to do my own thing. And, um, mainly because I felt like I, I, I wanted this to, to me, it's always been a servant role. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I could serve better in an independent role without restrictions and with more to give to new clients. Yeah. So um, in 2021, I opened my agency, 212 Insurance Group. And um, first of all, I did uh, 212 because my name is ridiculous. And I was like, I'm not putting my <laughs> name on this. It's too much. Um, so 212 comes from the theory, uh, 212 or 211 degrees water is hot. And at 212, it boils. And I actually learned that in a, um, um, a meeting when I, a marketing meeting when I worked at the cell phone company. So I was sitting there and I was like, you know what, this is it. Like I want to give in the extra degree. So that's my tagline with my agency is providing the extra degree of service. So that's, you know, kind of what got me to where we were today. And we've grown really well in, you know, the, the market right now is just ridiculous. And right. we've, we've grown, I have a great staff. Um, they all women staff, um, they all work from home. Um, I'm the one that primarily works in the agency because I do, I love my customers. I love seeing them face to face. And, you know, when they come in the office, they want to see me. So that's, you know, kind of where we are now. We're growing. We, we focus on, um, you know, we do personal lines, but my personal niches were chicken houses, churches, and trailer parks. You know, that was a, a big hit at Soup Live. Everybody thought it was hilarious. But, you know, my thing was this, like, I'm in rural Alabama. Like, you know, I got to go for what people have. And people, most insurance agencies don't want to mess with those things. But, you know, that's what brought me here. And, you know, going back to what, you know, you and I had just prefaced a little bit that, you know, that's how I got into insurance. But, you know, my mom, uh, my dad, my mom got pregnant when I, when she was in high school, uh, my mom and dad were young, um, they got married, they did not need to get married, which is not a big deal. You know, some people just are not meant to be together and they, they trucked it out, they tried. Um, but my mom was a single mom. Um, and she built a huge catering company. And it all came from when we were young, we were super poor. We came home to a single wide trailer. Um, she cleaned houses and then we would get invited to birthday parties and we couldn't afford to give gifts. So she would make their birthday cake as a gift, like whatever. And just like a funny little side story. Uh, one of our friends had uh, wanted a stone called Steve Austin cake uh -huh. and she, so she made it. That. Oh my gosh. You know, it was the grandest thing back then. She'd go and get these like sugar sheets made with like his thing on it well she my mom was very naive she was very when she was young she was very naive and she had wrote sob all over it because it was on the thing and she didn't know what it meant <laughs> so she showed up at this party with this stone called steve austin cake that said sob all over it it was that hilarious. is hilarious yes and so and you know and then that turned into you know doing baby showers and wedding showers which turned into doing wedding events you know big weddings corporate events and she even catered for tommy toverville who was Auburn uh -huh. War Eagle, he, their uh -huh. football coach, and then he's a senator now. So, you know, she, you know, 
I, I had her to look up to it in that sense, as far as work ethic and in doing what you need to do to get by. And, um, you know, there was a lot of that came with that, um, you know, with having young parents and divorced parents, there was a lot of, there was some childhood trauma there. And um, I didn't really, st- you know, kind of see that until I had my own child and I was older. And, you know, that's kind of the journey that led into it is I wanted a career to where I could serve other people mm. um, because that's what that fulfilled me when I was yeah. dealing with other illness, like mental illnesses that I couldn't put my finger on, if that made sense. Yeah. So, yeah. So that kind of, that gives you a little, little backstory. I love uh, that though. And I think yeah. a lot of people fall into insurance, like you mentioned, like they, they get somebody who pops in on them wherever they work or like a relationship they have or their uncle or their aunt or something like that. Like, Oh, you'd be really good for insurance. Um, I know a good friend of mine, uh, Lisa Engel, another uh, shout out with um, up at Willowwood uh, Insurance up in um, Minneapolis, Minnesota, or up north of there. But anyway, she ran into one of her daughter's friends, her daughter's an adult, and ran into one of her daughter's friends at like a coffee shop. And she was like, oh my gosh, and started talking to her. And she's like, you would be so amazing in the insurance industry. And she's hired her and she's yep. brought her in. And I love that that's how so many parts of insurance and people getting into the industry, so many people get in that way. I know, I know that not everybody stays that way, but at the same point, it's such a great, easy, like um, cultivating experience when you come in because somebody knows that you're going to be really good at it, right? And they it, see something in It makes something you feel it. Yeah. yeah. And it, you know, I had a, a meeting yesterday with a guy that, so part of one of the cool things that I get to do with my agency is I have a scholarship program and it's called the extra degree. And it, you know, we're a huge football town and it's during football season. So I do it for uh, one student that just is, you know, leading the, you know, the student body, um, a cheerleader, a football player and a band member every single week. And um, this student had gotten one of the, uh, he was band member of the week. And then, it, the, you know, I don't choose those weekly, but I do choose the scholarship recipients. Right. And he is just such a dynamic leader. Like you would see him before band, like before they would perform on Friday nights, helping his mom stock the concession stand and, you know, putting together a Veterans Day program and all this of just a good kid. And, you know, I, he I, he got one of my scholarships and found out he was going into business. And I was like, come talk to me about insurance because he just he's so mature and just I was like, you know, you would be so great. So I'm like you like it, it gives an opportunity like to kids like me, like. You know, I I went to school for five years. I didn't graduate. I was dealing with all these, you know, things like before my bipolar diagnosis in my head, didn't know what was going on. And I tried to self-soothe that with, with drinking and doing other things. And, you know, there's a lot of industries that you can't just step out of that into, to, you know, to get that to where you are. And that's been a huge thing with my agency is I'm open about that. You know, actually today on my, my memories was, I had made a post on Facebook and I had said it was a thing that I put on the door. Normally I would put, you know, I was going to lunch because I go to therapy once a week, every week. And I finally put, you know, why do I have to say that I'm going to lunch? Like, why right. can I be open and honest that I'm going to therapy? Like, it's okay. Like, why do we have to hide that? And insurance is an industry where you can be you and you being you is what's going to help you be successful. Yes. Yes. I love love that. that. So let's talk about a little bit of that journey, because I know that I know that one of the things and I'm going to say people struggle with, but especially women, I think, Mm -hmm. is especially in today's day and age with Instagram and Facebook and all the imagery stuff. And I know that's always been there. It's always been there. I mean, if we look back in in time, right, you had your your pinup girls, your Betty Grable, your mm-hmm. back of the day, right? You had your Farrah Fawcett when I was a kid, right? You walked into the, you know, uh, Spencer's Gifts or whatever, you know, and you had your your posters in the back, right? And you had your ideal of these beautiful, amazing women on Dynasty when I was a kid or, you know, whatever it was. And I think that we as women and as men to have images in our head of who we're supposed to be. And I think that most of our adult life is revolving around finding that and trying to be that without we're still accomplishing all the things that the world wants us to accomplish or what we think the world wants us to accomplish and somehow finding or dreaming that there may be some sort of balance between those and that by doing both by being our radical self as well as being radically who culture and society or whatever tells us to be that somehow we're still going to be happy in that space. And I think a lot of people are waking up and realizing that that's really not possible. We can't be leave it to beaver and, you know, um, 
whatever rock star traveling the world all at the same time, you know, that we have to find different ways to balance. But that starts with being honest with ourselves Mm -hmm. and getting the uh, truth in our spirit about who we are, what we are and where we've been and where we're going, what we truly want. And that's a journey. And that's hard. It, it, it is very hard. And, and, you know, going back to what I mentioned earlier, you know, there were a lot of things in my childhood, you know, that my, um, with my parents and with my family, um, I don't, I don't know if you've ever heard, you, do you know who J.D. Vance is? Um, no, I don't think he, I do. So he's an attorney and he actually, I think he, I can't remember if he's a senator or congressman, but he wrote the book, uh, Hillbilly Elegy. And it's so beautiful and it's so inspiring because he came from a background like I did where you have this constant um, life of, you know, whatever anybody's story is. Like, you know, a lot of people come from drugs. A lot of people come from, you know, abuse, you know, different things. He, his, his story was similar from mine because it was just a generational curse of communication is what I like to call it. Mm, yeah. Because my family communicated in drama it is the easiest way to say like we're gonna have a blow up but then we're gonna be nice to each other and you know I I suffered with that for a long time um, because I've always been a very empathetic person Um, I'm very outgoing now but when I was younger I was very timid Um, but you know my family and I love them to death. I love my family. Um, but it, it became a situation to where I saw, okay, this is not healthy. And I saw myself turning to coping mechanisms that were not healthy for me. Um, like I said, drinking, um, was one, um, you know, different, you know, depending on different relationships, um, you know, taking that, the relationships with, with men and, and seeing that that's, you know, that's in my worth. Or, you know, if somebody likes me, that's in my worth, you know, different things like that, that I think a lot of women and even some men probably struggle with. And I decided when I, when I found that I was pregnant, it was a shock. I was married, but you know, I'd never wanted to have children. Um, it's just, I wanted to be Carrie Bradshaw. That's what I wanted to be. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I wanted to be Carrie Bradshaw. So I, um, found out I was pregnant. And the moment that I heard his heartbeat, I fell in love. And I said, you know what? I am going to, I'm going to do better. And after he was born, um, I had horrible postpartum depression yep. and you know that if you, if you or any other women have suffered with that, it's, it's rough. Um, yep. I isolated myself really bad and that was in 2014 and I, I kept going to the doctor and I, I had a male doctor at the time and I was like, listen, I'm just tired. I'm worn out. You know, something's going on with me. Like, I don't know what it is. And he just, your mom, you're an in insurance, like you're in sales. Like, it's just, you're worn out. And girl, I'm going to tell you, I took every medicine, Wellbutrin, Lexapro, Zoloft, Paxil, everything you could think of and everything. And, and I was like, this is not right. And I remember in 2019, my aunt pulled me aside and she was like, she, she is diagnosed with bipolar as well. And she was like, you have something else going on. Like, I I think you might have a bipolar diagnosis because it was always a thing to where I would have these lows, but I was putting on a front. And I think a lot of women do that. We, we have to be tough, not for just us, but for our children. And there's been so many times, and I'm sure you understand this and most women will, where I've gone to the back and squalled my eyes out and cleaned my mascara up and come back with a smile on because that's what, we're indoctrined to do. We're supposed to be strong. And, you know, my mom had to be strong. So she didn't know how to cope with her own issues. So I mimicked what she went through and what my grandmother, like, we're just going to be tough. We're going to tough it out. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, finally in 2020, I got my bipolar diagnosis and um, had to wean off of medicine, went through bipolar psychosis um, and had not, a suicide um, not really a suicide attempt, but you know, during bipolar psychosis, you go through hallucinations and things. And I really was like, I'm, I'm going to get help and went through with my uh, psychiatrist and, you know, got on a plan, went through therapy and it really opens up your eyes to see like, okay, this is what I have, but it's not who I am. So how am I going to deal with this on a daily basis? Yep. And how am I going to get healthy for not only me, but for my son? And this craziest thing is I was diagnosed in July of 2020 and I opened my agency in July of 21. Wow. And, you know, and that, you know, that a lot of people say that because I'm like, you know, I look back now and I'm like, it was a motivator for me because I've for so long been trying to mm-hmm. cope, you know, in, in unhealthy ways. And I finally was like, okay, something was wrong. 
this is what we're going to do and we're going to deal with it. And then shortly after that, I started sharing my story because I'm like, how many other people uh-huh. are dealing with this? And yep. girl, you would not believe the people that reach out and they're like, I've been struggling too. And well, that's and there's why like a, there's like a shame around it that I think our culture has there said is. that if you have a, a mental um, or, or a, a, a challenge in that way, that mm-hmm. somehow there's something wrong with us. And there's, it's not, it's just our bodies, our brains, our, our chemicals just need to be maybe monitored a different way. It doesn't mean there's something we have to take that, that what's the word I'm looking for that verbiage, that, that story, mm-hmm. we have to take that, that judgment out of our vernacular because we have to change the conversation. Yes. And I love that you're doing that because I think by being um, really open and bringing awareness to it is, is the beginning to be able to start the conversation. So people can say, Hey, this person down the street for me, Hey, my mom, my dad, right. We think about all these adults around us and we think that they don't have any problems. We think that, you know, they're perfect, right. We see their Instagram, their Facebook, whatever. And we see their career. We see them. We don't see all the stuff that doesn't work, all the things behind the scenes, the, the areas where, you know, maybe they go home and they drink too much or they, they exercise mm-hmm. too much or they, they, I mean, exercise is a really good thing, but it can become unhealthy, right? Any, there's anything eating, right? I mean, I would be the type of person and I still can be who would lock myself in the pantry and just eat everything I can find, you know, because we all have some of those coping mechanisms, but they need to be healthy. Mm-hmm. They don't need to be unhealthy. And without conversation, they become very unhealthy very easily. You know, and that is such a profound thing that you said. And that was one of the biggest things with my diagnosis that really, really, like changed my mindset is because, you know, we always think of addicts as people who are sex addicts or drug addicts or are, um, you know, alcoholics, but we can be addicted to anything. Just like you're saying, you could have people who are addicted to the internet, people who are addicted to exercising, eating, um, even work. And that was a big thing with my, you know, my, I, I want to say identity crisis is, you know, what, what am I going to do? Where am I going to find my value? Yeah. And Michael McCormick and I had a really good conversation right after I opened my agency because I grew really quickly and I got thrown into doing a lot of meetings with people and, you know, talking with people and being on these boards of, you know, different things and it was always really weird for me because I was so much younger than a lot of the people mm. in there because and I didn't feel like I was worth it was worth I was like I, I don't need to be here I haven't been doing this as long as most people have you know look at my background look at where I was at and I was trying to find my worth in my sales and my numbers yeah. and you know once I figured out okay this is unhealthy this is not what I, need, I don't need to be comparing myself to all these people I mean yeah. because I know as well as anybody else. When I was on the soup live stage, you know, that was one of the first things I said is I'm not going to teach you about automation. I'm not going to teach you how to sell or any of those things. I'm going to teach you how to put yourself first and give yourself grace because you can't run a business. You can't be, you know, a mom. It's You can't be a wife. You can't do all those things without pouring into yourself because that's what mm-hmm. women, you know, in general are so indoctrined to do is to give and give and give and pour out. And, you know, I look up so much to these, these women that are stay at home moms and that want to be in their homestead all the time. Like, I love that for them. I could not do it. When my kid was home <laughs> with me during COVID, I was like, no, like yeah. I get, we were iced in in Alabama for um, a week back in January. And, you know, my office is only a mile away. And I was like, I'm going to hike to my office because I, I can't be in this house. Anymore. I will crawl my way if I have to. I will go I put anything, <laughs> put all the warm on me. I'll do that. But that was yep. the whole thing is I, I didn't want my identity to be that I'm bipolar. I didn't want my identity to be that I'm an insurance agent or I'm a mom or I'm this. I wanted it to be, I'm who I am. And these Mm -hmm. are the things that I love. And these are the things that I want to do with my life. These are my goals and my aspirations. And how am I going to get there in a healthy, in a healthy way? And I really had to stop last year. Like, you know, my production went down and I really beat myself up over it. But really the last year was when I really developed um, more healthy way of dealing with a day to day, you know, routines. And, you know, I still have my issues. I have ADHD also. I'm a terrible procrastinator. If you saw everything behind me right now, um, <laughs> the, it's a mess. There's like yeah. eight loads of laundry. Um, it. But, you know, that's part of it. And, you know, for the longest time, like people would say something like that. They were like, we just thought you had it together, even in school. Mm. They'd be like, we thought you had it together, but people didn't know what was going on behind closed doors and they didn't know what was, I mean, I remember being in the second grade in my family. I was the only kid that had divorced parents. I mean, I'm in 
rural Baptist Alabama. Like mm-hmm. that was weird. Um, but I look back now and I'm like, you know, that didn't define who I was and yep. I have to figure out who I am now. And, and I'm finally in a place now to where I'm secure in who I am and I, I'm unapologetically who I am. But, you know, and I think a lot of too, back to going back, we're talking about with society, we use that as an excuse sometimes to, you know, be in people's faces and be loud and to be ugly. And you don't have to do that either. Just, just be you and enjoy your life, man. Like yeah, have fun in what you're doing. If you hate insurance, if you're listening to this podcast right now and you're like, dang, I hate insurance, go do something Get else. Out. Don't be Get out. Or try I or love find it. something yeah. else in insurance. Maybe, maybe yeah. that's just not your role in the industry, right? I mean, yeah. there's lots of different ways to do what it is that we do, right? I mean, and maybe I don't need to be in service. Maybe I need to be in, you know, finances, or maybe I need to transfer over to commercial insurance and not personal insurance or vice versa. I mean, Mm-hmm. Or go into group health or Medicare or whatever. Do something different if you want to stay in the industry or do something else in a different industry. I mean, yep. there's so many different parts of this world for so many different people. Hopefully we can find our space and yep. be emotionally and physically happy. Yes. You know, and that's a huge thing that I, I talked to my therapist about this week is we, I feel like in the world, we chase the next best thing, especially now. And I feel so bad for our younger generation, like our, you know, minding your kids age love, because it's almost like they try so much because they have so much to deal with with social media. And, you know, we deal with that as, you know, grownups and adults and as, you know, business owners, but the kids have it way worse. And, you know, they're constantly attached. And I was mowing my yard yesterday and had my phone in my shirt because I was listening to Dateline. And I was thinking my grandma would like what did she do back when she mowed the yard back in the day because she didn't have a phone to keep on her and I think you know we're so attached to all this and it's it's penetrating our minds and it's poisoning our minds and you know we 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 chase this joy we think we if we get this if we do this next thing we're going to be happy and whatever and I talked to my therapist about this week and I was like you know I'm at the point in my life I don't even want to be happy I want to be content I want to wake up and I want to go look at my dang soybeans in my front yard and my creek in my backyard and just feel at at peace and at yeah. ease. And I think that's panic. different. People get confused about what happiness is versus peace. We think yeah. happiness is being on a yacht somewhere in the middle of the Caribbean on vacation or whatever. Right. And then we come back to our miserable lives. But I think yeah. being able to find peace is a totally different conversation. And it's so much more, um, worth it it's so it much more important than happiness it is and you know our peace is all going to be different like mm-hmm. you know one of the things that we talked about in soup is um a lady that i had met that said i just want to put a piece of you in my agency and i'm like no you don't because mm-hmm. peace to me and contentment to me is going to football games on friday nights and you know doing things like that you know growing my garden and you know she lived in the city like you're not going to do those things and that's okay right. like your piece is going to be something else but my biggest message to any woman is you know do you like and yeah. don't get stuck in this whole like oh it gets on my nerves this whole boss babe thing like oh i'm a i'm a boss babe i'm a i'm a mom and you know i'm doing all these things and i'm rocking and rolling i'm doing it in my 15 inch stiletto Louboutin yep. like go you if that's you but it's okay to be that and have a freaking mental breakdown and mm-hmm. you know that's another thing is we don't have to be strong all the time we can be we're allowed to be weak and yeah. we're allowed to show that weakness because what am I doing if I'm trying to be that woman all the time in front of my sons and to really see that that's their expectation as who they're looking for in a wife. And, you know, yep. strength is, of course, what you need. But in the same time, you want to think like, OK, like I want my sons to be like, let me, you know, let me load the dishwasher. Let me do the the woman things, too, because that we need that and we need that we support. We need it, especially when we're trying to do all the things. Well, and I think we need to make sure that we, we also understand that by being all the things and doing all the things, we're also cutting off other people's opportunity to rise. And Mm -hmm. I think that as a leader, we have to be able to say, I don't want to do it. I can't do it. It's not in my best interest. Maybe I'm not good at it. Maybe I want to eat off my left arm to when I'm doing this, right? But, but the thing is, if we delegate, if we if we empower other people to do those things that maybe they're really, really good at, like my husband is really, really great with numbers, loves numbers. 
I do not. And I love the fact that people are always like, numbers don't lie. I'm like, for me, they do because they never match up the same way twice. So I don't know who's lying here, but I can tell you right now, something's lying. And so- (laughs) And he's always like, but numbers don't lie. I'm like, nah, what do they do for me? How come my numbers are different from yours? And um, and my bookkeeper and da 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 da, like all these different things. And like I feel like I'm always chasing numbers, right? Like I'm mm-hmm. always changing, chasing things. And but I mean, so I I've gotten to where I'm like, that's what you're really good at. And why don't you and I sit down? once or twice a month, whatever. And let's talk about our numbers. Let's talk about, but I can't do it every day. It's just, it's not something Mm -hmm. that I can do every single moment, every single day. And I do a lot more in the business, but at the same point, I don't always want to do the ones in our personal life, right? We need to share that space. You know, like I don't mind doing the dishes. My husband hates doing the dishes, hates it. Yep. I don't mind doing laundry. He hates doing laundry, but I will not clean a bathroom if you pay me. I do not care. I will not clean a bathroom. That is yes. not my gift. And he's yes. Mr. Neat Nick in other ways. So, I mean, you find that though, right? But until you verbally say, I hate this, or I don't want to do it, or maybe I just need to hire somebody to help me clean my house and it's worth it, or whatever the conversation may be, until we're honest with ourselves, no one else will rise to come and have that conversation and help. And they won't even find their strengths because we're cutting them off from them being strong in certain areas. So I want to really challenge everybody who's listening to not only understand ourselves, but to allow other people to rise up in their own space because it gives them satisfaction. It gives them joy. It gives them peace to be able to be good at what they're good at. And that to me is what makes the world turn. It is. And imagine all the things that we are blessing the world with when we remove our guilt. Um, You know, that's just going back to like, you know, one thing that my husband was like, we're going to do last year is cleaning. We have somebody come clean our house every two weeks. And, you know, I felt so guilty about it. And I really started thinking about it. You know, me paying these people to clean the house is such a blessing because that feeds their family. And the same thing with my staff. And this is one thing that I love about you with your agency, too, is because you have set your staff up to know, like, their strengths compared to your weaknesses. And that's how I am with mine. I jokingly talk about all the time, Kelsey, my uh, she's my account manager. I, I say that my name might be on the building, but Kelsey's the boss. Um, because yeah. if I, Kelsey's so meticulous, she sets up all my appointments. She does, you know, all the things that I'm so bad at, but that's what she loves. And, yeah. you know, I, I wouldn't, I can't imagine doing running my agency without her because she picks up on everything that I, you know, can't do. I mean, I could do it if I really wanted to, but you know, I don't want to because I'm bad at it. And, you know, that's a huge thing for me is I felt so guilty for a long time because I'm like, you know, you know, during the day I keep my phone and do not disturb and have a voicemail set up that, you know, if people are calling, they need to call the agency because I was spending so many time, so much of my time doing mundane tasks throughout the day. Yep. And I was like, you know what? Kelsey's so much better at this. And she'll even tell me, she'll be like, stop sending people insurance cards. Like, stop it. You're making my life worse because you're trying to get your hands into little things that, yep. you know, what I do on the daily. And, you know, when I started to really remove that guilt and started looking at it as, you know, my guilt could be somebody else's blessing, mm. then that was huge for me. And, you know, just little bitty things that you don't think I mean even going back to the house cleaners like you know they come once a week every week and or once every two weeks and you know I had actually gotten in touch with them my mom she was using them and she was the same way my mom she passed away suddenly in December and that was a hard thing for her because she's always been very physical like catering is a very physical job and it was so hard for her to really give up doing those housework things Mm -hmm. um because she's always done them and you know, she was one of the ones that had that conversation with me too, that I ended up bringing to my therapist is she was like, it's okay not to do everything. Yeah. And we have to, because we're not, we're not designed to do every little thing. We are designed to love people, to serve people and to have relationships with people in your life and develop those to benefit one another. And I I truly believe that. I believe that every person in my life is here for a reason, whether it be a client or a friend or, you know, meeting you and different insurance professionals, um, because I feel like we can learn so much from everybody around us if we're willing to. But we also have to be open to it. And I think that's a really Mm -hmm. big thing. Is it being, um, really, really open to growth and not just like from a book or a coach or whatever, but just also 
Um, one of the things I've really had to work on the past few years is being open to suggestions and mm -hmm. or what I feel is criticism. So whenever somebody comes to me and says, or even like a client, sometimes we don't want to send out those surveys, right? Because we're afraid of what they're going to say if they had a bad experience, right? Or if they get a, if we get a three-star review or a four-star review, why did I not get five? Why did I not get five reviews or five stars? But by asking those questions and being able to do regular surveys with our team and with our clients, and then opening ourselves up to being able to have those conversations about what people want, how do they want it? We can level up, but we also, we just have to be, we have to be available for those conversations. Mm -hmm. And I think so many times, and I'm even talking about in my marriage and with my children, with um, my team, if I say, Hey, this, this da, 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 da. And they say, Hey, can we talk about that? Because I'm not really thrilled with how this is working. The old me would be like, you know, I would, I would just be, yeah. I'd be ready to go to town. Right. I'd be like, all right, let's go. You know? And I'd be like, you, you beef up, right? Like you're, you, you, you puff up and you're like, all right, let's go. But instead I go, tell me a little bit more about that. And I'm trying really hard, especially in my marriage to be able to say, okay, well, that makes, that makes sense. Let me, let me think about that for a little bit. And I will definitely process that. And there's a lot of times that when I step back, I realize that that really has a lot of validity to it. And mm -hmm. I really need to make sure that I, I spend time and effort and energy on whatever it is that I need to grow in, but we have to make sure we're also open for those conversations. And I think that's a big mindfulness thing is making sure that when we find ourselves almost like Honestly, that my skin starts to tingle. I don't know how you get whenever you start, you know, like you feel like somebody's like gonna say something or attack you or whatever. Sometimes my skin starts to tingle and there are certain things that I start hearing myself in my head going, but wait, but wait, that you don't understand. And when I do that, I go, stop, mm -hmm. listen and process because then it does, it opens me up to be able to say based on their work style, based on their learning style, based on their goals in their lives, maybe based on their background, their history, I need to take that into consideration. And we need to be, I need to be more open for this type of a conversation. And um, I think for me, that's one of the things in the past, like two years, I've really tried very, very, very hard to be really present about. And I think it's the core foundation of being able to be open for growth is to yeah. be able to take those, those conversations and grow with them. Yeah. And you know, and it's okay. Like that is another huge thing. I, I have this written down everywhere. Uh, one of my, my psychiatrists told me this years ago, it is okay for your reality to affect your emotions, but it's not okay for your emotions to affect your reality. Mm, and we take everything like so personally. And if somebody comes to you and you've hurt them or you've done something that you didn't think about, it's okay to feel like crap about it. Like you're allowed, you know, you may even get mad about it, but it's like you said, take a minute and really take in consideration all the things that they're communicating. And that's the biggest thing is in this world today is nobody wants to communicate. And, yeah. you know, we really have to communicate, you know, with our, with our clients, with our friends, with our family and our marriage, and to really say, you know, Hey, you know, and open to communication. Hey, this is what's happened. You've really hurt my feelings. You know, maybe I am being a little bit dramatic because I can be, but you know, let, and you know, and you have those conversations and you can't tell me that 10 out of 10 times, even if those conversations end up in, you know, breaking off a relationship or something that it wasn't meant to be, um, yeah. it, until you figure it out. And it's better to have those conversations and get it out in the open and, and deal with it. Just the same thing with like with a client, for example, you know, whatever it may be, you know, I've never had a client be mad at me for telling them the truth. You know, we had a client not long ago that they declined to have a certain coverage on their policy. And, you know, we had it in document, you know, documented and everything. And they were so upset about it. And, you know, we finally, you know, told them, hey, you know, you're allowed to be mad, bro. You can be mad all day long. That's good. But here's what we're going to do for, from now on. We're going to yeah. deal with it as it is. And then we're going to add it on there. And then you'll never have to deal with this again if that's what you want. Be mad about it. I'll be mad with you. And. There's nothing wrong with that. You, there's nothing wrong with being having your emotions, showing your emotions in communication, because just like you were saying, like the communication is is growth. And if we're being stagnant in life, we're not living. Yeah. And yeah. There, that's the worst thing that you can do. And mistakes come from that, too. There are going to be mm -hmm. times that we're going to make mistakes. And yep. again, it's learning, right? It's learning. It's growing. I always say that whenever we whenever we, we're, we're not learning anymore, we're done. Like we're yep. going to be called, you know, and we're done, you know, we're going to transition, be called to heaven, whatever the words are you want to be able to use. But mm -hmm. the reality is, is that we are constantly supposed to be growing. It is what we're mm -hmm. supposed to be doing. We're not supposed to be 
this pinnacle of humanity to where we just have everything figured out. I mean, it's, it, there is nobody, there's nothing out there. People that say that they've got it all figured out are lying. Yeah. They're lying. And we can pretend to have it all figured out. We can, but the reality is, post- is the reality is going to come and kick me in the butt one of these days and tell me how yep. much I don't have figured out. And we can post it on Instagram all day long. You know, like I said, I could post this on this screen still and you'll think, wow, she's got her life together. But if I turn this computer around, I'm telling you right now, you're going to be like, okay, she's living like me. And that's, that's the biggest thing. And I think that's the biggest thing with, with, with my agency and how I wanted to be, because it's such a, especially in Alabama, the most people, you know, the the own agencies in Alabama are white males. There's not a lot of minority in here. And, you know, that's the thing is they're white males with the black slacks. First of all, when I opened my agency, I said, I'm never wearing another pair of slacks in my life. I got rid of every single one of them. Um, I'm not, I don't know if you're familiar with Queen of Sparkles, but you know, I'm a little girl. You gotta look it up. It's wild. This is the most, this is the most tame outfit that I have worn in a while because, you know, it is what it is. And I, you know, when I opened my agency, I had a lot of naysayers that were around and they're like, you know, she was just a salesperson. She's not going to do it. And at the end of the day, I was like, you know what, I'm going to put who I am and, you know, what half of my clients can't even tell you what company they're with. They'll tell you they're with Kalia at 212 Insurance Group. Yeah. And I love that because I know that. I've built those relationships and that's what my agency was, you know, founded on is, you know, having those relationships with clients and being honest and being who I am. And even if that's the good, the bad, the ugly, even if that's putting a sign on my door that was like, you know, be right back, had to go to therapy, um, you know, or or talking about things, you know, I had a spell on Monday um, that just came on like a a psychosis spell and, you know, they come out of nowhere, they're triggered by trauma, you know, different things. And it was not a good day. And I was like, you know what? I can either share this and, you know, we don't have to share everything on social media, but I was like, you know, people are looking at the highs of life. They're saying, I just went on vacation. They're saying that I just spoke at soup live. They're saying, you know, that, you know, we're doing well and all these things, but they need to see the, the ugly too. They need to see your laundry yeah. that they yeah. need to see it. Yeah. 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 You know, I had, um, I had somebody once tell me, that it's through it's through the trauma that that we create the diamonds and the gold, you know, mm-hmm. and that it's through the struggles. And um and and I do feel like you know I I entered this industry. I was working with my dad with Allstate, but he I didn't have a license like I did unlicensed stuff. I did a lot of the back end stuff for him. He wanted to go independent. We went independent. And I just remember thinking I had all my crap together at one point. Like I remember thinking that oh this business thing is so much easier than. Then, um, and then I thought it was, of course I was like six months in. So don't, don't, don't sit around and think that I was super successful at that point. I just thought, oh, this isn't that big of a deal. I'm selling policies. I'm slinging policies right and left. We're doing great. We're doing awesome. We're growing. We're da da da. Right. And then, you know, and then there have been multiple phases in my career in the last 21 years. So I've owned my agency for 21 years and there's been so many times and I could, and honestly, it's like almost 18 months to every two years where you have, a, where most people have a major traumatic experience of some sort and um between having team members and my personal trauma i mean i got a divorce at one point got remarried that ended up in a divorce ended up remarrying the man that i divorced i mean girl i got it i got i got all of it we've even done podcasts about my trauma you know kind of thing my my husband now and i went through a podcast about how the business uh affected our and how blended with the relationship kids um the industry, his job, he quit his job, become join me in the agency, then two entrepreneurs that he had never been an entrepreneur before, just that emotional concept, right? And it was hard. And we did a two part podcast on that, because I know that other people are working with their spouses, or they, their spouse may or may not want to be able to come join them in the industry. And, you know, people are trying to figure out that maybe they go through a divorce in this situation, maybe they don't get back together, you know, but even then, it's like, there's so many hard conversations, there's so much love and joy in the journey, but there's so much trauma, even as an adult, that we take into our souls that we, that it helps to fuel us forward. But it starts conversations like these, like what you're talking about, that then we can be honest and we can be real and mm-hmm. we can talk about our trauma. So then the next person feels like they're not maybe quite as um, off the rails as maybe they think they are. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And then, and then even feel like, Um, even just feel content in knowing that it's okay to be a little out there. It's okay to have, 
that trauma, it's okay to, you know, to go through that and, you know, live through that because it's the hardest thing in the, in life is, you know, comparing yourself to other people like yeah. that. We can't do that because the more that we do that, we're never going to be happy. We're never going to have com- contentment. And, you know, that's not even comparing yourself to people in the good days, but even comparing yourself, like I went through a struggle at one time because I was, you know, I knew people who had dealt with trauma like I did in the past and to where they are now compared to where I am. And I felt so guilty about it. Like I almost had imposter syndrome about it because I was like, I don't deserve this because why did this person not do what they needed to do for themselves. And, you know, that all comes down to, you know, choosing to be healthy and, you know, mentally healthy and choosing yourself every day. And we have to, and then, you know, just going back to what we said in the beginning, like with women, we have to make sure that we're choosing us because it's so easy Mm -hmm. to not, and I can see my life slipping when I'm putting other people in front of myself. And and I say that and not in a selfish way. I say that as in just like we were going back to earlier, is like filling my own cup because there's, I can't, I can't feed you when I'm not, when I'm not growing my garden. Yep. So, yep. So true. So true. So true. So whenever people can connect with you and whenever people can get with you about your business, your agency, your, your conversation. And, um, I love how honest you are because I think that is part of what attracts your clients to you too, Mm -hmm. right? Is that whenever they get with your organization, whenever they get with you, you share yourself in such a real way that they feel like they know you. I think whenever we have these, um, environments of fakeness. Um, I think we don't show our true self. And when we do that, it's almost like our ourselves and our team becomes a call center type environment. Like one of the things that people I think have become so disconnected with is the fact that so many businesses have gone into like call centers where you don't have a personal relationship anymore with your banker, with your, you know, your insurance agent, with your whatever. Right. And with that, we take apart the personal relationship. But when you bring yourself authentically to the table, People know who you are. They have a relationship with you. They have a relationship with your team. And I think it makes them feel free to ask those questions maybe that they would Google otherwise and maybe get bad advice, right? Like don't go to WebMD, talk to your doctor. But if you don't know your doctor, you're going to go to WebMD, right? Yep, you're exactly right. I mean, that's what it is. And I know that in our agency, that honesty and that vulnerability and that approachability is, is, is comforting to so many people because they don't know who to trust anymore. Mm -hmm. Yep. You're exactly right. And you know, that is, that is a huge thing. And, and, and just admitting your faults, admitting when you're wrong and then going out of your way to be, you know, to be authentic. And then not only that, but just to really care, you know, there was a, back in the day, I remember, you know, there's so many insurance agencies or agents in my area that I do look up to. Uh, There's an alpha agent right down the road and she's such a good supporter she's wonderful and you know I look at that and I think you know I remember back in the 80s and the 90s and your dad was probably one of these agents I imagine whenever there was somebody that had a a home loss or like you know you know whatever like you know they would take them you know dinner or deliver their check to their house or just go check on them and you know that became such as you know so scarce and even in in Alabama where, you know, people are, you know, your neighbors and your hospitable and everything. And, you know, that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be, I don't know if you are so with Allstate when the agents of good thing came out and that's what I I wanted to be. I wanted to be an agent, you know, an agent of good. And that's one thing is, you know, I always say is like, I may not have the best rates. I may not have, you know, the companies that you want, but if your house is on fire, I'm going to come stand with you and I'm going to hold your hand. And, you know, I'm going to, you know, do what I have to do to make sure that you know that I'm not only there to help you file your claim, but I'm actually there and actually care like if if it was mine. And my husband, he, he laughs at me sometimes, like not in a, you know, mocking way or whatever, but he was like, sometimes I feel like if our house burned down, you wouldn't feel as bad as if your clients. And I said, I would not. <laughs> I was <laughs> like, if a tree hit my rental property today, I would be like, peace out, tree, peace out, tree, peace out, rental house. But if it happened to one of my clients, it would, it would destroy my heart because I really do care for them. And, and I am empathetic with what they're dealing with. And, you know, that is a, a plus in this industry, but sometimes it, it is, a, you know, it is hard. Yeah. Um, and that that's one thing with our agency that I am very proud of is, you know, we may not be a $10 million agency at this point, but our retention is so high because people really do. Like I had a client that she FaceTimed me last night. She, they have a farm and uh, she FaceTimed me and 
just was ranting and raving and she was showing me her soybeans and I was showing her the soybeans that are planted on my seven acres in front of my house. And uh, we were just joking around about that. And she said, you know, that's one thing about you is she was like, you really do, you care. Like you, you're not fake care. And you can tell when people are not genuine yeah. for sure. So that's, that's huge. And, and, it, and if people would really attach onto that and just really, you know, like you said, learn, keep educating yourself, be who you are, be authentic. Don't try to replicate what else somebody else is doing. Like, you know, do the courses, take all these courses that they have that people put out, go to these, you know, conferences, make relationships and learn. But I'm going to tell you this, and you'll remember this from Soup Life, the most profound, and you know, all the speakers were phenomenal, but the most Mm -hmm. profound things that I had heard were from Ryan Hanley, and David Carruthers, and then Andrea Vargas. And it's mm-hmm. because they left their heart on the stage. Like, you know, I, I couldn't tell you, like, you know, any, like, the the automation, you know, the commercial stuff, any of that stuff that they would have normally talked about. Um, but when they went up there and they talked about similar to what I did, like, you know, times are tough. You're going to figure out how to make money. You're going to figure out how to feed your family. But these are the things that you need to be working on right now. And we just have to remember that we have to put that as, as the forefront of what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Kalia, if people want to reach out to you there and, um, in Alabama and if they, my little thing just fell over. Literally something just fell behind my computer when you, we, right before Are you, you knocked it down. I'm like, what's going on? We got I some don't know, spirits but something going, awesome's on. going on. We're just, we're just all there together. Right. We're in that symbiotic <laughs> space. Yes. yes. Eight hours apart. I don't know. Yeah. But if people want to connect with you, if people want to connect with 212 Insurance, if people want to get to know you better, how can they reach out to you to connect? Facebook. Just look me up on Facebook. And I, my Facebook is open. Um, I don't, nothing's private on there. You can go in there and find my weird pictures from college. Um, you can <laughs> find my baby pictures of Ezra and you can find um, all my crazy posts about my, you know, everything. So Facebook and People are, you know, feel free to message me anytime. That's a huge thing is I want people to know, like, you know, especially if you're going through having thoughts of suicide and think that, you know, things are are, are rough. You know, I, I've been in those situations before and I know what it feels like to be an impending doom. But you, you, I want people to know that I, I will be there. I can be there with you. And I don't mean that in a, you know, in a, a silly way, like, you know, I'm going to drive all the way across to California to hold your hand, but I'm going to tell you, hey, I get it. And just to have somebody else get it is so meaningful. It is. It is. And somebody just to walk that path with you and maybe follow up Mm -hmm. like two weeks later or something like that and just go, hey, how are you doing? You know, I think that's so powerful. It is. And you never know how much that means to somebody just to reach out and just go, hey, I was thinking about you. Mm -hmm. Just little, just little. If we all just added those little things in life, this world would be so much better. It wouldn't be so So divided. I agree. I agree completely. Well, Kalia, you've been amazing as always. And I always love talking to you. So thank you so much for taking the time to be able to share your heart and your business with us today. So I really, really appreciate you. Yes. Thank you for having me on. I love, I'm so glad I got to meet you and I love your girls. I got to meet, they're just, they're so good, you know, just such sweet girls. And it's just, it's, it's awesome to get to know everybody. And, and, and that's a huge thing too, is just hold on to people that, that are around you. Hold on to people, love them all, and be kind to everybody. That's all we've got to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. I love it. Well, everybody, this has been another amazing episode of the Power Women in Insurance podcast. My name is Teresa Kitchens, your host. Today, we've been amazingly talking with a great conversation with Kalia Finch. And if you are looking for her, make sure you reach on out. 212 Insurance out of Alabama. She is fire. She's amazing. And we are thrilled to be able to have her on. So thank you so much. And everybody, make sure you check us on out on Spotify, Google uh, Podcasts, Apple iTunes, all those different places. I forget all the places because, you know, I, <laughs> I mainly do. I mainly do Apple, you know, not for all my podcasts. But everybody, check us out. We are thrilled. Thank you, Kalia, for joining us. You have been a yes. blessing. Thank you. All right, everybody. I'll see you next week.